Uh, well, welcome everybody to tonight's debate on individualism versus conservatism. My name is Tom Gilligan, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's debate. Uh, tonight's debate is brought to us by the Salem Center, which is housed here at the Macomb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. The center is committed to supporting research, practical tools, and dialogue that spans the world of academia, public policy, and business. Tonight's debate is intended to be, to be given in this spirit. I want to spend a minute talking about tonight's debate format. Uh, tonight's debate or conversation is about two powerful and potentially competing worldviews, individualism and conservatism. Debate about their relative values will be structured as follows. Each of our speakers, who I'll introduce shortly, will be given 10 minutes for their opening remarks. After their opening remarks, each will be given two rounds of five minutes for rebuttals and replies. The third segment of our uh, debate tonight will be up to 40 minutes of audience questions with two minute replies. There are speakers, I believe, queued up at the end of the row. As we get to that part of this uh, debate tonight, I'll point that out and you can walk up and ask your question. Uh, and then both, both uh, speakers will also be given an opportunity to give five minute closing statements. Before we start again, I want to thank you all for coming tonight, and I hope you enjoy the debate. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Yaron Brook, speaking on behalf of individualism. Dr. Brook is chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute. Dr. Brock is a scholar and accomplished writer. He hosts the Yaron Brock Show, which airs live on YouTube, and speaker. He was a regular columnist at Forbes.com, and his articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Invest Investors Business Daily, and many other publications. His most recent book, entitled In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance, makes the case that few industries are more vital to our prosperity and more maligned than the financial industry. Brooke and co-author uh, Don Watkins explain why finance has faced so much criticism and why, despite the conventional image of financiers as greedy and reckless, finance is a moral image uh, is a moral industry. Brooke and Watkins also authored a national bestseller entitled Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government, and a second book entitled Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. Dr. Brooke received his PhD in finance from the Macomb School of Business in 1994. Speaking on behalf of conservatism is Dr. Yoram Hazani. Dr. Azani is president of the Hersey Institute in Jerusalem and currently serves as chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation, a public affairs institute based in Washington that has hosted the National Conservatism Conference since 2019. He hosts a NatCon, NatCon Talk, an interview program on politics, religion, and philosophy. He, too, is an accomplished writer whose works have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Fox News, CNN, NPR, Time Magazine, The New Republic, National Review, Commentary, First Things, and American Affairs, among others. His highly acclaimed book, entitled The Virtue of Nationalism, was published by Basic Books in September of 2018. His most recent books are being published this year and are entitled The Revolution of Sinai, The Revolution, I'm sorry, The Revelation at Sinai, What Does Torah from Heaven Mean, and Conservatism. A rediscovery. Dr. Azani received his PhD in political theory from Rutgers University in 1993. Please join me in a round of applause for both of our speakers tonight. And Dr. Brooke, you are on the clock. Thank you. Um, the mic on? One, two, three. One, two, three. There we go. All right. Uh, let me first uh, thank the Salem Center, and in particular, Greg Salmeri, for uh, hosting this event, for making it possible. Uh, thank you all guys for being here, and Yoram, thank you for agreeing uh, to, to do this debate. You know, we live in a really unique place. The United States of America is not just any other country. It is a unique country because this country, as opposed to pretty much every other place on planet Earth, was founded on an idea, it was founded on a moral idea, an ethical idea. This country was founded on the idea of individualism, 
on the idea of the sanctity of the individual. The idea that man exists for his own sake. That he's not a slave. He is not a servant of others. His life is not here to be sacrificed for some common good, for a tribe, for a nation, for religion, for anything. That man exists for the purpose of living his life by his own standards, pursuing his own values, using his own minds, in pursuit of his own happiness. Now, this indeed was a revolutionary idea. It was a revolutionary idea based on a deep and engaged study of history. A deep and engaged study of history in terms of what worked and what didn't, what was right and what was wrong, what was moral and what was not. And the conclusion our founders came to was that freedom of the individual to pursue his life, to pursue his values, to use his mind, to use his reason, was right, was just, was moral. And indeed, that the purpose of government, that the purpose of the state, was to make that possible for the individual. To leave the individual free, free from coercion, free of force, free of authority imposed on him, so that he could use his mind to pursue his values. We call the concept that captures that idea, we call it individual rights. And the United States of America was founded on this concept. It is at the heart of what this country is about. And of course, the consequences of that have been magnificent. This country has become, in many regards, and in almost every respect, the greatest country that has ever existed, both from the ability of people to pursue, indeed, their happiness and their success, uh, to pursue material wealth. We, the United States became the richest, wealthiest country in the world, not because of natural resources or any other mythology, but because its people were free to use their mind, to pursue their values, to create, to build, to innovate, to make. It became the land of the pursuit of happiness. It became a land that millions of people wanted to go to, not because literally the streets were paved with gold, but because they by exercising their own judgment, could create the gold for themselves, could create that wealth, and could pursue that happiness for themselves. It is the land of the pursuit of happiness. It is the land of the individual pursuing his dream, making choices about the kind of life he will want, free of coercion, force, free of authority. Now, that... This country was a political manifestation of that, those ideas, fulfilled, unfortunately, imperfectly. From the beginning, there were compromises. And those compromises are compromises we have paid dearly for, for 200 plus years. Yes, the obvious compromise of slavery, which is completely inconsistent with the ideas of the founding, the principles of the founding, and for which this country paid dearly in a civil war, but that didn't end it. We had Jim Crow, and to a large extent, we're still living with kind of the consequences of the attitude towards slavery at the founding of the country. There were inconsistencies in terms of its application that went beyond slavery. Government did not, unfortunately, restrict itself to only protecting individual rights, to only protecting a freedom. Whether it was from the beginning, Government education, which I think is the heart of many of our problems today. The state involvement in educating our children, which was accepted by the founders from the beginning, unfortunately, and has only grown in its influence and its power to this day. And whether it's the regulation of business, and in particular, you heard about my latest book about finance, the regulation of finance, which really was part, unfortunately, of the American founding from day one. Um, and we are paying dearly for that, for the state involvement in finance, business, to this day. So, this amazing experiment, which is America, 
built on principles and foundations that are that were individualistic, were idealistic, and I think were true, were implemented inconsistently. And the consequence of those inconsistencies, indeed, is I think what we are observing today in an America in decline. America is declining today not because of an abundance of individualism. America is declining today not because people are too individualistic, but indeed exactly the opposite. Because of a lack of individualism. A lack of people taking responsibility for their own life. A lack of people using their minds to guide their lives in a thoughtful, long-term, rational way. A lot of that is a consequence of the fact that government has controlled our education for 200 years. A lot of that has to do with a philosophy that has abandoned and turned its back on the foundational concept of this country and of the enlightenment from which it arose, which is the idea of reason. An abandonment of the idea of personal responsibility and individualism. Today, we have a political system in which we are torn, not between individualism and some form of collectivism, but between a variety of different forms of collectivism. There is no political movement of individualism today. It's not that the left is individualistic and the right is collectivist or the other way around. We have two forms of collectivism, one of, of the right and one of the left. And the only anecdote, the only solution to the challenges that we face today is an embrace, a return, and an embrace to individualism, a return, an embrace of freedom, a return, an embrace of a separation, not a return, but a separation of state from education, of state from business, from the economy, an adoption of a truly individualistic uh, system. Ten minutes is like neither here nor there. Right? Um, let me say a word about conservatism as a proposed solution to this. I think in one regard, and we haven't heard Joram yet, but I did a little bit of reading, uh, on the one hand, Yoram offers an, an honesty that I don't find with many conservatives. He doesn't pretend to be an advocate of individualism. He says, here's what my conservative means. And it means some form of collectivism at its heart and its core. And at the heart of the core is an idea of nationalism and religion as part of that nationalism. After all, he is the founder now Oh, one of the founders of the National Conservative Movement in the United States. It is a conservatism that harkens back to tradition, that harkens back to the past. But this is exactly the past that our founders, I think, justly rebelled against. This is a past where there was no progress, where the economy did not grow, where quality of life did not improve, where people's life expectancy was not did not expand. This is a past, and you can take it back 2,000 years or 10,000 years, where income and wealth and longevity were flat, didn't move. It's only when the world, particularly the United States, to some extent Europe, embraced elements of individualism. It's only when tradition was disregarded it's only when people were given the freedom to challenge tradition in every respect did we see the explosion of growth and prosperity and advancement that we saw starting with the founding of this country and have seen for the last 250 years. Thank you. Dr. Rizani, let me check the mic too. Is that all right? Okay, thank you, Yaron. That was, as usual, moving. He's a very eloquent speaker. And uh, even though my job this evening is to, uh, to defend conservatism, and that means I'm going to have to 
find all sorts of ways to create a big chasm between me and your own so that the audience can be entertained. There's nevertheless, um, he's eloquent and he's right on many things. I enjoy listening to him. I, so, so just to get it out of the way, I just want to be clear that um, Yaron and I agree on a lot of things. Uh, we agree, for example, on the crucial role that the creativity of the human being plays in economics and in other things. We agree on the importance of, uh, of, of work as a value, of labor as a value. Uh, we, we agree that the free market is by far the best engine for economic growth uh, that mankind has known and, and uh, support it for that reason. I would go further. I, I even agree with Yaron about, his, about the idea that, uh, that what he calls selfishness, the, the motive, the driving force within the heart of the individual man or woman to better themselves, to improve themselves, to, 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 to seek a better life for themselves and their family and their friends. I, I agree with Yaron that that is a good thing. And when people say that it's, a, that, that it's sinful, I, I think they're mistaken. It's a good thing. We agree about that. And we also agree to an, an extent, to a significant extent, about the state. Yaron and I both think, or, or I, I agree with him, that the state as an inst instrument of force, as an instrument that collects power, is easily corrupted and easily turned in the wrong direction. And in general, as someone who lives in, uh, in, in a socialist country, in general, I think that the state is far too big. Right? In other words, the, the direction that you're on wants of greater individual freedom in economic areas, in general, I'm on his side. All right, so that sounds like we agree with a, about a whole lot of things. Nevertheless, as I said, we're going to have to create some clash, so let's do that. Um, Yaron's individualism, I'm going to argue, uh, has three things that are wrong with it. One, it's incomplete. That is, I'm going to argue that although he's correctly describing a small part of what human beings do, human nature, he's basically missing a lot of human nature and he's mi basically missing a lot of how, what human society and politics is like. And because his view is incomplete, it's unsustainable. That is, he's created a, a, a view of the way that, that political society is supposed to work, but it can't actually be sustained, not for more than two or three generations, and we're already seeing that now. And finally, because it's unsustainable, it's wrong. And when I say wrong, I don't just mean imprudent in that it, it, it's going to destroy us. I also mean morally. One of the things I love about Yaron is that he always turns the argument towards the moral issue. And I'm with him on this. I think the moral issue needs to be addressed. And I think that morally, you cannot defend an individualism of the kind that Yaron is defending. And I'll try to explain to you why. Now, let me say a word about, just a, a, a word about conservatism. I think individualism is more intuitive and less confused in people's mind. I'm going to be using the term conservatism uh, roughly the way that Yaron was using it. Conservatism as a political standpoint that regards the recovery, elaboration, and restoration of tradition as the key to maintaining a nation and to strengthening it through time. All right, let me say that again. Tradition, a conservative says, is the key to maintaining a nation and st strengthening it through time. Now, I just said that, with, that, that my trouble with Yaron's uh, individualism is that it's incomplete and it's unsustainable and therefore wrong. Let's focus for a moment on this issue of sustainability. Conservatives are always thinking about sustainability. In, in fact, sustainability is just, it's like a more modern newfangled word for conserving. Con what conservatives are trying to conserve is they're trying to figure out what do you need to do not for your, your country to be exactly the right thing it's supposed to be right now, they're trying to figure out what are you going to, what do you need to do in order for it to still be around and be in better shape 30 years from now, 50 years from now, 150 years from now. That's, that's the lodestar. Every conservative thinker is an actual conservative, not, not some of these, you know, like, like people have been using the name for the last 30 years. I have no idea why they, they think they're conservatives. But people who are real conservatives, you know they are easily because the first thing that they ask is, what do we need to do to sustain, to sustain our nation or some other community? All right, so 
what I want to do now is I, I want to say just a few words about what Yaron is missing, in what Yaron's individualism is missing in his description of society. This is going to be a little bit philosophical, and then after that I'm going to turn to concrete examples to make it clear what I'm talking about. So what kinds of things are, is Yaron missing when he talks about the individual and the freedom of the individual? Well, for starters, I, I, I just need to say one thing about uh, the American founding. We can talk about this a little bit more later. But Yaron, when Yaron is talking about the founders, he's usually talking about specific founders. He's talking about Jefferson. He's talking about Paine. And they did think things that are very similar to what Yaron is attributing to the founders. But part of what's being left out in Yaron's description is that, that um, the American Constitution wasn't written by Jefferson and Paine. It was written by a different political party, the Federalist Party. The Federalist Party is the American Nationalists. Washington, Adams, J. Hamilton, and a guy named Governor Morris, who's the primary author of the American Constitution. This group, who I think were the real founders of the United States, but we, we don't have to resolve that one. This group of Federalists are conservative in the sense that I'm talking about. They're the ones who, who write into the Constitution in, in its opening lines things like, in order to form a more perfect union. That is, they're worried about social cohesion. They're worried about how the nation is going to be brought together. That's not, that's not a question of individual liberty. That's a question of what does the nation, national leadership need to do in order to bring the nation together. They add things like posterity for ourselves and Austerity. That is, they can't, they can't think of the purpose of government without thinking hundreds of years into the future and saying, we're, we need to do what needs to be done in order to conserve traditions. Now, what, what traditions are they talking about? Well, primarily, the traditions that they're looking at are English traditions. The American Constitution is mostly an, a, an elaboration, a variation on the British Constitution, on the English Constitution. What I want to say about... Uh, 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 what I want to say, in addition to this historical point, which is that there were conservatives at the American founding, and they were very, very important people, and in fact, you can argue that they're the ones who actually founded the United States and not the individualists. But in, order, in addition to that, I want to talk about what, what kinds of ideas are they thinking about? What, what, what do they see besides individual liberty? So very quickly, one thing that they see, I mentioned cohesion. Cohesion is... A, a way of describing a nation or, or some other group of people when the ties of mutual loyalty that bind them to one another are strong. Okay, it's the same as in a family. It's the same as in a marriage. Uh, when, when you, when a husband and wife and their children, when they have cohesion, it means that under stress, they come together. You know, they're always competing with one another. The children are always bickering. Even the husband and wife, they're always bickering. They're always, you know, competing, you know, to, 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 you know, to, to see who, who, who does and who doesn't take out the garbage. There's always competition going on. But when there's stress from the outside, when there's an attack or a danger from the outside, they come together if they're cohesive. And that cohesion, that, that, that quality of cohesion, it comes from the mutual loyalty of the individuals. Now, conservative thinks it like in, in the following way. Conservative says says, look, if we want our family or tribe or nation to be conserved, we want it to last, to be sustainable, then we have to think about what kinds of things create loyalty, what kinds of things create, uh, 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 create cohesion. And it turns out that the question of how do you create cohesion how do, what institutions do you need? National, religious, schools, what kinds of institutions do you need in order to maintain a particular entity, the, the, the nation, for centuries? Those kinds of questions get answered, and they only get answered when you think as a conservative. Now, I'm not saying that individual liberty is not important. What I am saying is that individuals compete up until the moment where they're challenged, and then they better be cohesive. They better be loyal to one another. And the same thing is true for, for, for tribes, different groups within the nation. They compete against one another until there's a threat, and then they come together cohesively. What's wrong with the United States right now, a scary, scary time, is lack of cohesion. You put pressure on it, and all the tribes fall apart and hate each other instead of coming together. Right, that's a very, very real characteristic of, 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 uh, of a certain kind of country. Um, all right, I'm going to have to stop now. So I.
be more examples. And you're going to get so many examples, you're going to say, stop, stop giving examples, but it'll be later in the next round. Yeah, so I, uh, I'll focus on two points uh, that I think are important. One is, uh, Yoram says he agrees with me on free markets and labor, you know, hard work as a value, and, and a lot of these things. And, and, it's, and it's, it's true. I think he does. But the, the difference is, and it's an important difference, and it's the crucial difference, is what is the standard of value? Why do I think free markets are good? Why do I think it's important to work hard? Not because I think it makes a country, a nation, a group better off. It does. But that's not my moral focus. The reason I believe free markets are good is because they are the only way in which individuals can express their liberty, their freedom, their choices, their individuality. Free market is the only place in which people can do things without asking for permission. My standard is that individual liberty. My standard are the individuals and the value they represent and the values they pursue, and the happiness that they have a right to pursue. So I'm for free markets, not because it makes the state better, which I think is implied in Yoram's agreement with me, but because it is the only system that allows individuals to live their lives as they see fit, based on their values. So I think while there's similarity, there's also difference, because... I think as we approach these things from a moral perspective, our moral codes are very different. My moral code is about the individual. Morality is that, the good in morality is that which is good for the individual, qua individual. Qua human being. Not what is good for the group, the state, others. And that is the core of what Ayn Rand talked about when she talks about selfishness or, 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 or self-interest. It's about, not about the fact that most people behave in a kind of way that supports their own values, kind of, but a morality of self-interest is about taking your life seriously, living by certain principles that lead to a great life, to the best life possible for you as a human being given the context in which you were born. So I think the standard of value here is very different. But let me say something about unity. Because, shockingly enough, I am very pro-unity. I like the idea of unity. And indeed, I like the idea of posterity. Uh, you know, I care about the next hundred or so years, maybe not beyond that. I, don't, I can't really project more than that. I absolutely think that those are good things. And I think that one of the real problems in the world today is this breaking apart of American society into little tribes, into little uh, communities of entitled, you know, I don't want to insult them, but you know what I mean, um, where everybody is fighting everybody, everybody's at each other's throats, everybody wants what the other one has, everybody is demanding something at the expense of others. But you see, I think that this disunity comes from a focus on collectivism. I think that this unity comes from the idea that the state can decide what is good for us in the long run. That the state can allocate resources. Well, when the state allocates resources, then anything they give you is taken from me. And now I don't like you. Because it was taken from me. When the state intervenes in education, then Yoram doesn't get to educate his kids the way he wants to. He gets to educate, to have his kids educated the way the state wants them to be educated. And I don't get my kids to be educated the way I want to, but the state decides how they get educated. But if education, for example, was all private, then Yoram would send his kids to the schools that he thought were appropriate, where they got educated based on his values and his principles and his ideas. And I was, and we would never be in conflict. We would never be yelling. Like in America, evolution or, or, or uh, uh, creationism. No, you want to send your kid to the creationist school? Fine, I'll send my kid to the evolutionary school. Right? So it's the fact that we have centralization, that we have planning, 
that the state believes, as conservatives do, that we can plan for posterity, that we can set up. No, the beauty of the American system is that they set up a system of unity around an idea. The idea of individual rights, the idea of individual liberty, the idea of individual freedom. And that that's what unites us, that idea and willingness to fight and, and for that freedom. I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about posterity. In the next five minutes, yeah. yes. Dr. Rizani. Okay. Yaron, I, I'm pulling out your book, Free Market Revolution, which is, it, it, look, it's really fun to read, Yaron. You should really, really read the book. Um, it, it, no, no, I'm, not, I'm completely serious about it. You learn a lot. Um, I, I want to quote a couple of things, and this is with respect to posterity. You say that, 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 that the reason that we're not able to be unified, that we're not able to be a cohesive society, is because of the fact that, is because of the fact that, that, that you know, people are, are fighting over, factions are fighting over uh, the government allocations. Well, some of that might be true, but I think that a much deeper and more direct point would be to say that you and a, a long, illustrious line of people before you have insisted on individualism at the expense of thinking about the greater whole at the level of the family, at the level of the tribe, at the level of the nation. And you're right, I'm, I'm, I'm not a purist. I'm, 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 I, I'm, I'm saying that realistically we need, some, we need to have a balancing act. We need to have some kind of balance. When you say things like, uh, that, you're, like that you're seeking a world, quote, as free as you would be alone on a desert island. Right? You're, you're teaching people, you're a great teacher, you go around, you, you, you write books and you get, write, give hundreds of speeches and you teach people that they should try to be as free as you would be alone on a desert island. You're on, no one is able to be as free as you would be alone on a desert island. And not only that, nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. People who try to do that, that that's, that's like my, my son who's living in, 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 in the basement and he's unhappy. It makes him unhappy to do that. That all of Jordan Peterson is trying to tell you, no one wants to be as free as you'd be on a desert island. Or, or how about this? Um, you're, you're proposing a philosophy for people who, would seek, who seek nothing more than the right to live an independent existence. Again, no one actually can live this way. I mean, maybe you can, but almost nobody can. Normal people can't live this way. They don't want only an independent existence. And here where you say, you focus on career, and you write beautifully about career. You say career brings purpose to a person's life. It is the central activity that enables him to make his days not a succession of pointless repetitions, but a meaningful sum. It's a person's main form of creativity, growth, and personal achievement. P production is the essence of a moral existence. Look, that's beautiful, but it's not true. It's part of the essence. Production is part of the essence. Family is not less a creative act than business. Putting, putting effort into the family is not less important than putting time and effort into your business. And the same thing is true for the nation. What you're proposing is a nation full of people who can't see the sum. They can't see the whole. They're constantly looking at every given moment about what it is that they personally get out of it. And they're not thinking about what they would get if they raised a family, what they would get if they, if, if, if they served in the military for their, their country, uh, which I know you did. And look, the bottom line of, of all of this is, I, I, I think that the dichotomy between, uh, be, between, um, individual, be, between in, individualism and collectivism is false. There is such a thing as collectivists. There are socialists, people who believe that the government should plan the entire economy. I'm not one of them. I'm not one of those people. But what I am saying is something like this. Okay, and here, here I'll give, give a couple of examples. I'm saying that when you reach the point where the free market has created conditions in which private individuals pursuing their own good, private corporations, are offshoring, they're offshoring the jobs of millions of Americans, for example, this happens in other countries too, they're offshoring the jobs of millions of Americans and they're sending the, those jobs to China. If you only look at it, if you only look at it from the perspective of the individual and his freedom and his rights, then you can't find anything wrong with it. 
You have to go to a higher level and look at what's happening to the nation, what's happening to the cohesion of the nation. And here, if you're realistic, and this is what I'm asking you to do, Your Honor, is to be realistic. If you're realistic, then you realize that there is a limit to how much you can ship other people's jobs off to a different country while you make money and they don't, and they're unemployed. There's a limit to how much you can do that before the cohesion, the social cohesion begins to, to, to blow apart. I'm not arguing for socialism. I'm arguing for realism. A conservative is somebody who's realistic and says, look, there has to be a balance. There is a point beyond which you simply cannot continue to think only about the individual. Dr. Brooke? Uh, thanks. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to take on the offshoring because uh, this is my topic. Um, God. Look, the challenge here is, of course, that the central planner always sees things in the free market that are setting somebody in the equilibrium. Somebody, I'm sure, has thought, people here at the, in, in the city of Austin actually thought, that Uber was indeed upsetting the tradition of taxicab drivers, upsetting their profession, driving them out of business, and chose to shut down. Uber was shut down here for two or three years in Austin, or something like that, uh, during a period. Uh, it was tough to get around Austin without Uber. There's always somebody being upset by innovation, somebody being upset by progress, somebody who feels like they have lost from progress. But of all the things that conservatives complain about offshoring, first, it's questionable whether offshoring even occurred. Production jobs in the United States have declined by about 50% while production itself has increased. We produce more stuff today in the United States than at any point in our history with half the people. But we produce about 100 times more food with about 1% of the people who used to do it 100 years ago. Not because we offshored food production, but because we used technology to make that production far more efficient. And who is the beneficiary of the fact that we import some productive things from overseas? Who benefited from that? Well, it's the lower middle class and poor people in this country who benefited from that. They're the people who shop at Walmart. They have benefited enormously from the importation of, quote, cheap goods. And indeed, all of us are richer. The quality of life and the standard of living in the United States has gone up dramatically. And how much offshoring of jobs is legitimate? What kind of trade deficit is okay? Who is going to decide? Should we offshore steel but not t-shirts? Or should we offshore, should we uh, you know, develop this industry but not the end industry? Should we do chips? Should we do that? Who gets to decide? Of course, this is socialism. And of course, this is central planning. There is no difference. It's just an issue of scope. And the scope is bound to increase. Because as you start restricting for example, placing tariffs on steel because you decide that that is a uh, national necessity to have steel. You raise the cost of automobiles, and therefore people get laid off in the automobile industry, and then you have to find a, a program that compensates for that. Like uh, Trump had to compensate the farmers for the fact that the Chinese would buy soybeans. And on and on it goes. There's no end to government intervention. Once you violate the principle of allowing government to start centrally planning and decide what is acceptable and what is unacceptable, there is no end to that slippery slope. And there was never justification to begin with. Now, if you were worried about steel workers who lost their job in Ohio, then it would be great political leadership to tell the steel worker to get in their car and drive to south, to, to northeastern Arkansas where there are jobs, which is again what this country was, the kind of principles this country was founded on, where people took it upon themselves to go to where they could raise their families to the best of their ability, to, to, to pursue the opportunities that exist out there. Unemployment rates, while everybody's been complaining about offshoring, unemployment rates in the United States have been at historical lows. And in spite of what leftist economists keep telling us, standard of living and quality of life in the United States for the middle class has not declined. But if we keep telling people, your jobs will come back, don't worry, the government will take care of you. We will send you a check. Just stay in Cincinnati, Ohio. Don't go to where the jobs are. And it's our duty to help you because we're a nation and we're all in this together. Right? 
and don't take personal responsibility for your life. Then yes, you will start getting real sociological problems. You will start getting people feeling alienated. You will start people being upset. You will get what we have gotten in this country over the last 10 years instead of in terms of an uprising among the, it's not because their standard of living has gone down. It's because they've been told that they will be bailed out by the government and they haven't gotten the bailout. And they keep waiting. Instead of being told that their life is their responsibility and to go out and live it and to make the most of it. So no, I, I, I don't think conservatives, I don't think you can just tinker with an economy. You're either going to control it or not. And we've seen the history of the United States. In every case, they started small. And we know where we are today in terms of the amount of regulation, the amount of control, the amount of influence they have. Thank you. Uh, before uh, Dr. Azani gives his final five-minute rebuttal, I want to remind everybody that the next section is Q&A from the audience. So formulate your brilliant questions. And towards the end of his five minutes, please walk to the front of the aisle and we'll start the question and answer period. Dr. Azani. Yaron, I don't think you're answering my, my question. The question in my mind is, what has been left out when you tell people year after year that they should be as, as free as they would be alone on a desert island? What I suggest is that when you tell a husband and wife, when they're getting married, you tell young people getting married, that they should be as free as they would be on a desert island, then you put pressure on them to, instead of riding out the hardships and the pain together and to come together in face of hardships, to take the opportunity when hardship comes along to blow the relationship apart. When you tell children that they should be as free as if they were alone on a desert island, then what you do is you take away the tradition of, the, the, the biblical tradition of honoring your father and your mother, and you give them a different standard for how to live, and you blow the family apart. And it's not surprising that the number of children in the country is below replacement. The reason it's below replacement is because people keep telling everyone that you, what you need is to be free. What you need to be is a free individual, to be independent. And you're like a sucker if you stay married for 50 years. Believe me, that's not an easy thing to do. You're like a sucker if you give honor to your parents. And the same thing is true at the, at, at the level of the nation. You're a sucker if you serve in the military. You're a sucker if you, if, if you don't take advantage of, of, uh, 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 of immigrants flooding across the border, and, and instead you want to, 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 to hire locals. Every single one of these things is the same thing. Every single one of these things comes down to one philosophical issue, which is, is individualism complete? as a description of politics. It is not complete, it is incomplete. What you've left out is that in addition to working for, for a job, people also build tribes. They build little tribes, they build families, and those families have to stick for, for 50 years or 100 years. They, they, they build tribes which are like organizations like the, like the Ayn Rand Institute, for example, which is supposed to stick for 100 years. They build military units, innovative military units that never existed before, and that, those are supposed to be sustainable. And they build nations that are supposed to be sustainable. And at every point, rather than telling people, look, your personal motive of improving your life is important. It's very important. But your personal motive of improving your life should be devoted, should be devoted, not just to career, but to const constructing uh, tr little tribes, families that last, nations that last, institutions that last. Instead of explaining to them how to do that, you keep telling them, act free. And when you say act free, you mean only one thing. Act free from tradition. Act free from the guidelines that help you figure out how to keep a marriage together. Help, help free yourself from the tradition that a businessman of a certain country also takes into account the people who work for him who are his fellow citizens. They're part of his own tribe, part of his own nation. That's the issue. The issue is if human beings can possibly create something sustainable when they're not thinking about anything other than their own individual freedom? And the answer is obviously no. 
We need to have people who think about their individual freedom. It's good. I said it at the beginning. It's good for people to try to improve their condition. But while individuals are improving the condition, they also need to think about how they can improve the condition of their family, which Yaron, I think, accepts, and of the larger tribe or region and of the nation, may, may, maybe even a, a, an alliance of nations. If you don't have anybody thinking like that, then what happens when it goes in the wrong direction? Now, here, here's an important point, really important point. Yaron asks, and, and many, many people do, this is a common question, who's to decide? Who's to decide? Yaron and I agree that, that there should be a massive reduction in the scale of government, but I still think that government has to be able to do the things that the American Constitution said that it's supposed to do. The American Constitution was written by people who believe that the purposes of a government are a more perfect union, justice, domestic peace, common defense, general welfare, that's the well-being of the, the, the people as a whole, the general welfare, liberty, and posterity. Number six is about individual liberties. The others are, are, are collective attributes of the nation. And it's the job of the president, the job of the elected officials, the job of, of people who we, sent, we elect and sent to, to government. It's their job to decide when. It's their job to decide how much. There's no such thing as, no, they don't get to decide. You elect them and they decide how much. You need to teach them the way that they should make the decisions. I'll agree with you on a lot of those decisions, but it's up to them to decide. And that's not a question that has no answer. That's a question that has an answer. That's why we have a government. For questions, if any of you have any questions, you can walk to either mic. Please uh, identify yourself, tell us who you are, uh, and ask your question. If you can make it as concise as possible, we would appreciate it. Hello, my name is Jason Rines. I'm a professor of philosophy. I'm trying to understand um, exactly what it is that you sort of value in, in the conservative system. Um, you mentioned, say, divorce rates. Um, so say 50% of people who get married today are likely to get divorced. And if we were to tell those people, look, there's something bigger than you. There's a marriage and there's something bigger than your marriage. There's the population rates of this country and, that, and we need that for national glory or, or, pro, or prosperity, prosperity, uh, posterity. So we could, you know, somebody could make a law, someone could just push it on them, they could stay, and we could have, you know, twice the number of miserable marriages. Uh, 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 sorry, that's assuming the people who stay together are miserable too. Forget my math. The point is, um, you could have lots of miserable marriages, and, and, and suppose, you know, you'd have more birth rates or something. Who would that serve? What would, the, what would the benefit of that be? We could make every child be baptized or have a communion. We could force people who don't want to carry through a pregnancy to have to carry that through all on some traditional notion that you pick out from your religious tradition. Um, and, and even supposing that we let you do that, right, what would, who would it serve? You kept saying something bigger than yourself. Is that the only thing, that it just can't be just the individual? Is it that this is something that will outlive me, right? So, like, it's literally temporal. If so, if we make this thing that lasts 100 years, 200 years, if in the process of making it last for 500 years, we make it 500 years of misery, what was the point? Wouldn't it have been better for it to have just collapsed after one generation? So what is it that's of value here? Okay, look. Your own sets up... Your, your own sets up uh, the, the idea that we should be searching for uh, we should be searching for those values which give us a good life. You know what's astonishing about this formulation is that it's the same thing that that you read in the book of Deuteronomy. Not not that many people read and read the Bible that often anymore. But if you read in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, "I'm setting before you." the value system, let's say, I'm setting before you the value system that will give you life, and you have the alternative, which is to do whatever you want, and that's death, and I ask you to choose life. 
Yaron is like a kind of a modern Moses. He's making the same exact argument that Moses was making. Okay? The difference... So, so we're both assuming that there is such a thing, that there, we're both assuming that there is such a thing as a set of values which, if you were to ha be able to hand them down, you, if you were able to inculcate them, then they would give you as an individual and the society you live in life. We, we both agree on that. What we're disagreeing about is the following thing. That I think that the arbitrary claim that only pursuing your own self-interest where self is defined as narrowly as you can possibly define it, that that is destructive and that doesn't lead in the direct direction we're trying to go. Human happiness does not come from this. Human happiness comes from something else. It, com it comes from taking yourself, the desire to improve yourself, and expanding that to a family. And so that becomes your, your desire to improve yourself becomes de a desire to expand your family. And then you expand it further and it becomes the desire to expand your tribe or your community, your congregation. And you expand it further, that becomes the desire to advance your nation. In other words, what I'm proposing, and I, I think conservatives just generally propose this, is that the individual is unhappy when he or she lives as though he has, they have the freedom to, to uh, the freedom of a person on a desert island alone. They're unhappy that way. If you want to know what's going to make people miserable, that's what's going to make people miserable. What's going to make people happy? It's expanding their self to larger groups that they identify with themselves and caring about them too. Thank you. Yeah, so. <laughs> I have to reread my book, because I don't remember ever saying that you should be free, you should go to a desert island. Um, and, and indeed, I've, I've often argued against it, uh, because they, they, of course, there are immense values to you as an individual, as an egoistic individual, in marriage, in family, in community, in associating and relating with other people. I have to admit, here on stage, that I've been married almost 40 years. Four zero. <laughs> and I'm no sucker. <laughs> I'm a selfish fill in the blank. I do it because my wife makes me feel great. And I think I make her feel great. We complement each other. We make each other better. We're both self-interested. I have children. I had children because I thought, sometimes I change my mind about this, but I thought I would really enjoy it. I didn't do it. So the book name could continue into the future. I didn't do it to preserve, I don't know what. I did it because I wanted the joy, the pleasure, the satisfaction, the love that comes from raising children. All selfish, all self-interested. And indeed, I would never go live on a desert island, although I have gone to live on an island. Uh, it's, <laughs> some would even argue it's a bit of a desert. But I love civilization. I love other people. I love interacting with them. I love communicating with them. I do this all day and all night. I love, you know, seeing their achievements and, and their, their, their production. But it's done from the context. What is the standard of value? What am I trying to achieve? My happiness. I'm not doing it for an idea, an idea called the family. I'm not doing it for the state. I'm not doing it for posterity. The result, I think, is posterity. But I don't think I'm doing it. I mean, we could get into why I think child rates, uh, birth rates are declining. But it's not because people are too self-interested. It's because of all the other pathologies that we have in the world in which we live. Thank you. Let's go to the other side of the room. I'm Alex Cranberg. I'm an engineer, not a philosopher. <laughs> but you each um, have bemoaned the, the loss of cohesion in America. Aaron, you, you, uh, you blame the additional government programs and, and, um, and the sense of entitlement. I... I I was just looking at a survey of the numbers of people in America that consider religion to be very important in their lives. And it just happens that that's gone from 61 to 48 percent in the last 15 years, 20 percent drop in just 15 years. It's pretty remarkable. 
Uh, do you see that as being a symptom or a cause of this loss, last loss of cohesion, a symptom or a cause uh, uh, by increased sense of government entitlement? What's the interplay that you two see between our, our national pathology and this loss of importance of religion? It's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of what I think of the, uh, I, I, I think, first, I don't think it's a bad thing. So you're, you're built into the question is an assumption that is, it is necessarily a bad thing, and I do not. Let me say something about what I think the real cause is, because while I think the political cause is what I mentioned, I think there's a more fundamental cause, and this goes to the issue of religion. I think the fundamental cause is a breakdown in the philosophy that has always, or that has uh, inspired Americans for a long time, an implicit philosophy. Most Americans are not philosophers, they're engineers, but they have an implicit philosophy. And I think in America, there was always an implicit philosophy of individualism. There was always this idea, people came here and people lived here under the idea of taking responsibility for their own life, for their own families, for their own futures and not living in the moment. I've never argued to live in the moment in the sense of not thinking long-term, but how to use your mind to plan long-term so that you have a successful life over the span. And I think that was always implied as an implicit philosophy in Americans. And I think one of the great virtues of Americans with religion was always relegated to something you did on a Sunday and something you did maybe with your kids and, and stuff, but it was never taken overly seriously by Americans. Religion, this was never a religious country. It's become more religious, I think, today than it was uh, 100, 200 years ago in spite of those surveys. And what I think has broken down is that implicit philosophy, that philosophy of individualism and independence. Independence not in the sense of living on a desert island. Independence in a sense of guiding your own life by your own mind through your own effort. Right? And I think that philosophy is, is being dissipated, is being destroyed. Uh, partially philosophically by school of thought that have come in and said, no, we're all our brothers keepers, we all have to take care of each other, There's social responsibility, and again from the left and the right, and by the welfare state, which has sent this message. No, you don't have to think for yourself. You don't have to care for yourself. You, you know, we're all our brothers keepers. And that has slowly destroyed the ideological foundation of what it meant to be a man. Dr. Zahn. Okay, so page 128. I don't, I, I really don't mean this as a, as a gotcha. I just think that this is the spirit that you get in this book, which I urge you to read. Page 128, a society of rights is one in which you are as free as you would, I'm sorry, as, as free as you would be alone on an island. And now that I've read that, let me just read down the page. It should be obvious that there can be no such thing as group rights or collective rights. A group, is merely a number of individuals. Now look, Iran, I, I don't think that the founders could possibly have agreed with you. And now even talking about Jefferson, the first sentence of the Declaration of Independence is the assertion of a collective right. It talks about uh, when in the course of human events, when one people d determines that it's going to separate the bonds that tie it to another people and take the station that I'm sorry, I don't have the exact line memorized, but take, take, take the station that is its right among the nations of the world as an independent nation. Okay, look, those, those founders were much more interested in collective rights than you say they are. They were also much more interested in religion than you say they are. It's very difficult to find one of the founders who didn't think that public religion was crucial for the United States. Washington, Adams, these are uh, uh, Hamilton, all of these people said explicitly and in pub pub public forums, they said that if you give up on the, the religious traditions which carry the moral traditions, then you will lose the constitution of this country. That was their outlook. And what you're saying is, let's just take the individual liberty part, but let's drop the part about public Christianity and their nationalism. And that can't work. It's not sustainable. This side, please. Hello, a student here from the Salem Center. So a question for each, both relating to values. So Joran, you talk about conservatism. 
I'm wondering, and values, of course, I'm wondering how far do we go back for those values? I mean, is the Bronze Age man said the good way to go? <laughs> how do we know? Um, I'm curious. And for Yaron, so Nietzsche called for the transvaluation of all values. Is Brandism up to the task? Say transvaluation? Of all values. What does transvaluation mean? I'm sorry. I, A revaluation and examination. A revaluation, yes. Of, you know, the proper philosophical ground for those yes. values. Is what up to the task? Uh, Rand, Rand, Rand. Rand. Got it. Thank you both. Whoever would tell I can't, I can't remember the question. How far back do you go? Oh, how far do you go? That's a good question. That's a very good question. I like that question. Look, um, I, I'll, tell you some, I'll tell you something funny about uh, this national conservative um, uh, uh, movement that um, I've been involved in together with some of the people in the audience here. It's, um, you, there's all sorts of people in the movement. And uh, one of the favorite things that Catholics have to say is, uh, you know what the real problem is? The real problem is the, is, is the Reformation. You know, like, like if, if only we could just not have had the Reformation, then we've got the right, you know, the right conservatism. And then, you know, I would never say this normally, but as soon as you start talking like that, I start thinking, you know, among my Jewish friends, of course, you know, maybe the problem was the New Testament. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, wouldn't we have a better conservatism if we just didn't, you know, didn't do that? And uh, of, of course, if you really want to, you can go, you, you say, no, the problem is the Old Testament. And, and, and really, really, it's the old paganism. Look, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, the, the, the answer is something like this. Okay, now, now I'm just channel, channeling Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke um, represents the common law, the common law tradition in England, he, he speaks for, he thinks, the way he understands it, he speaks for, for, uh, for 800 years at least of, of uh, English legal and political tradition. And what he says is the traditions don't stay the same. The traditions swish back and forth. We, we make mistakes. We make changes. Problems come up and, and then there's trial and error. And sometimes we have a good solution to a problem that comes up and it becomes part of the tradition. Sometimes we have a bad solution and then we have to go back. His principle, rule of thumb, is we always need to be going back to the moment where things went off the rails. So if you ask me, probably, <laughs> I should, should ask me sure. the next question. You always go back to the, the moment that you believe things went off the rails. Um, so, this is an easy one. Uh, one would answer, yes, she's up to the task. Objectivism is up to the task. I can't see it. Um, uh, absolutely, I think. Uh, and if you, if you, look, if you disagree, but you're willing to accept the challenge of debating the values that are necessary for individual human flourishing, then that's a debate that we should all be happy to have. Right? If we can get away from framing morality as self-sacrifice, framing morality as somehow the subjugation of the individual for the purpose of the group, for the purpose of a collective, for something else, i.e. framing morality as equal to altruism. If we can now ask the question, okay, morality is about individual human flourishing. Let's, you know, I'm not sure about Rand's um, specific values and virtues. Let's discuss which ones are, are most appropriate for individual human flourishing. Great, that's a conversation that is worthy of having, and that's a conversation where we can push the boundaries. But yes, I think I have never heard an, I haven't heard an argument why they're not, and I haven't heard an argument for anything better. I think they're grounded on a solid foundation rooted in, in, uh, in uh, reason and rooted in human nature, rooted in the, the fundamental alternative that all human beings face, and that is to survive, to live, or not to live, and what is required for living living both just surviving and living qua human being, i.e. flourishing. And I think she gives the ultimate answer. So absolutely, I think she's up to the task. This side of the room, please. Dr. Hazoni, um, I'm curious, in your opening statement, you referenced the founding fathers and kind of Washington uh, and Hamilton versus Jefferson, Madison. Uh, so maybe, somewhat similar to the last question, but like if you put yourself back at that point in time where it seems like that was an important time for you um, historically, um, would you have sided with uh, 
with Washington at that time, or would you have like wanted to conserve the British Empire? And I'm curious how um, how you would reconcile that. <laughs> These are great questions. I love it. Uh, uh, first of all, I wasn't there, so I don't know. Okay, just to be just to be clear. Um, not that old. <laughs> not quite, not yet that old, but I'm getting there fast. Um, let, uh, let, let, let's look at it like this. Uh, the, the, the revolutionaries thought that they were defending, if you're talking about, I'm not talking about a Tom Paine who's a real radical, but, uh, but Washington in his circle, they actually thought, what they thought that they were doing was defending, defending the existing constitution of the empire. Their argument for why they, why they should revolt, their argument was uh, that, that there's a traditional, traditional English constitution in which uh, the, the, uh, the, the parliament is in dialogue with the king and the parliament determines whether there's going to be taxation in dialogue with the king. And the claim was that, that the, the English were violating the English constitution by the way that they treated the Americans. That, that, that was the argument. The argument was fundamentally a traditionalist argument and their claim was we're trying to preserve something that works and what you the English are doing is you're destroying something that works. So I, I, I have a pretty good feeling that I, that I would have been on the side of Washington. Now, you, you, you could and should ask me, well, you know, does that mean that you'd, you know, you'd support the Constitution with slavery? The party that I'm talking about mostly opposed slavery, but the, the, the question is important nonetheless. Slavery was an evil. It was an evil that was invented in America, meaning that there wasn't slavery in England. It was, it was something that was concocted by the Americans. It was an innovation. And the Americans should have gone back to, should have been going back to their, the English anti-slavery traditions. Let me give you a better point. Oh, no, I can't. Sorry. So, so uh, yes, I would have sided with Washington. This side of the room. Mm. You didn't mind, yes. <clears throat> Question for you on. Did, did you want to? I'm sorry. Nope. You're not going to say who you would have sided yeah. with? Yeah. I, 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 so I'll do this. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. I mean, we could have a whole debate about the founding of America, and I'm no expert, but I, I, I would suggest that uh, the Declaration of Independence, more so than the Constitution, is a truly revolutionary document. Uh, and yes, it was authored by Thomas Jefferson, a uh, radical, and, and one, I, uh, with exception of slavery, happy to be on the side of. Um, but it was signed by a lot of people, including, uh, including uh, uh, Washington. And it was indeed... Uh, authored not just by Jefferson, but was edited by Adams and Franklin, uh, who supported the declaration. Um, and Adams is typically not considered a radical, although my friend uh, Brad Thompson who wrote a book about Adams, would certainly consider him on the side of the radicals uh, in this perspective. And of course, it's hard to mention the Constitution without mentioning Madison, uh, who is in many regards considered the author of the Constitution, and I think is on the side of the more radical Perspective. Propaganda. Um, what's that? Propaganda. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, but you know, I'll let you guys judge uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, the founders. Um, I wish they had been more radical. Uh, and I said in my opening, I think I think the downfall of America that we're experiencing today is a consequence of their lack of radical. I would have first, of course, on the issue of slavery. Um, it would have saved a lot of blood, a lot of blood, uh, a lot of, and, and a lot of uh, horror uh, to uh, to the slaves if slavery had been had not been uh, sanctioned. And I will say, I don't think slavery was an American invention. The Spanish had slaves. Uh, the British bought slavery to America as part of their colonization. Um, uh, slavery was all over the world. It's always existed. It had a particular character in the U.S., but that's not that dissimilar to the character it had in Brazil and many other countries. There's nothing unique in that sense. Um, and it is only the ideas of the Declaration that ultimately led to its abolition. But of course, uh, as I said, I, I would have separated state from education and I would have separated state from economics. Uh, it, and that is a kind of radicalism. I, I think that if we had in the Declaration of America, we'd be in a much better state. We would have, what were the words? Uh, we would have achieved better prosperity and greater unity. <laughs> this side of the room, please. Mostly for your um, um, 
you say that you kind of second your own when he talks about individual freedom, etc. But it seems to me that there's a key difference that you're meeting, and correct me if I'm, what am I missing? I want to find out. Seems to me that his brand of individualism, I'm, it's volu my interaction with others is, vol is fully voluntary mutual, by mutual agreement. You decide that there's some bigger body there, you call it the whole, that can coerce on me to interact with other people, to do other things, because Big Brother knows that it's better for the whole. Where, where do you draw the line? Uh, by number of votes? I mean, let's take it to extreme. Uh, Hitler followers, a majority, that decided for the whole it's better to get rid of the Jews. Some of us would not be around if that would have gone to the extreme. Right. Thank you. Right. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, your own rights in a capitalist society, all human relationships are voluntary. All human relationships are voluntary. And my claim is that this is a false description of human beings. Human being, there is no way to make all human relationships voluntary. You, when you're born, you do not choose the family that you're born into. You don't choose your parents. I'll give you, I'll tell you something surprising. Even your parents don't choose you. You, you are someone that your parents didn't choose. Maybe they just have a child, a generic child. But you, that 17-year-old who's throwing fits in the living room, your parents never chose you. All right? Relationships are not voluntary. We don't choose the country that we live in. Now, it's true. Some of us do. A small number do. Yaron and I actually both chose which country that we live in. So there's a small number of people. But the overwhelming majority of people do not choose the town in which they grow up. They don't choose the religion in which they grew up. They don't choose the nation in which they grew up. So the, the claim that there's such a thing as human nature can, can allow all human relationships to be voluntary on the model of trade, of win-win, that's a complete absurdity. It's a fantasy. We need to be realistic. Human beings are what they are. We can, we, can, we, we can make them freer than at certain times in the past, but we can't make them free of the following kind of thing. I, I, I have a relative. I, I don't usually talk about this. I, I, I have a relative uh, who is mentally ill, who's been mentally ill for decades, and I'm responsible for caring for that, my, 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 my wife. Do I get anything out of it? No. It just hurts like hell. It's just pain. Okay, but, but it's something I have to do, and I want to try to figure out what, what, where does it come from. It comes from the fact that I want to uphold the values of my tradition, which includes taking care of parents. That's where it comes from. But, but is, it, is it an individual? Is it me as an individual? No, me as an individual is only suffering from it. You can't make decisions just this way. You have to balance your, your rights and your freedoms against duties which you inherit. And you may be able to ameliorate them, but you can't just get rid of them. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> freedom is this tricky word. Um, when I say free as you would be in a desert island, it's freedom as opposed to what? Freedom in what context? It's the political freedom that you have on a desert island, i.e. nobody tells you what to do and nobody coerces you. Of course, you don't have the freedom to choose your parents. Of course, you don't have the freedom to choose who your child will be. You have the freedom to choose whether they have a child or not, but not who that child will be. You don't have a freedom to choose to ignore uh, gravity. You don't have a ch the freedom to choose to deny the metaphysical facts that exist. But once those metaphysical facts exist, you get to choose what you do about them, how to behave. You chose to take care of your relative. For whatever reason, you chose it. It was a voluntary decision. Nobody coerced you. And what the whole idea of the desert island is to say, coercion should be out. Nobody is there to coerce me on a desert island. There should be nobody equivalent on, in society that is able to coerce me. Um, one of the reasons... One of the reasons I'm so pro-immigration is because I want people to be able to choose where they live. I want people not to be stuck 
in the country, in the village, in the town where they happened accidentally to be born. They're stuck there metaphysically because that's where they were born. There's no way around that. But once they're at the age where they can make a choice, I would love them to be able to choose where they get to live. And that's why I'm so strongly for immigration and strongly for free markets so people have the maximum opportunity to make as many choices and decisions that they can in their lives as they live them in the realm where choice is relevant. Choice is not relevant with regard to the metaphysical. That's side the room, please. Okay. This is a question for both of you probably. So um, Dr. Hassani and Dr. Brooke, I keep hearing you guys talk that the, the general um, subject of this discussion was conservatism versus individualism. Um, so when I hear you talk about cons conservatism, I hear you talk about a lot about sustainability and about tradition. And I'm just wondering what your, um, I, I hear from Dr. Brook that, uh, when he talks about individualism, I hear him talking about flourishing, not just sustainability, but, but flourishing. So in my mind, sustainability is like kind of a baseline of we're, we're meeting a bare minimum. And flourishing is going beyond that bare minimum and, and reaching some higher goal. So I wondered if you could elaborate on what you think flourishing would look like uh, while looking at conservatism. And Dr. Brooke, if you could elaborate on what you think um, sustainability looks like in, a, in an individualistic society. Uh, good question. Look, do, do you want to go first? Okay. I, I, I just started, she said Dr. Khazoni, so I thought it was me. Um, I, I um, um, look, collectives, human groups, loyalty groups, groups that are bound by mutual loyalty, um, they, they, they have certain characteristics that, that seem to be common to all such, to all such groups. Um, so uh, every, every loyalty group has material concerns. You know that, that 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 there's enough food, that there's shelter, that whatever there is, that that's true whether it's a nation or whether it's a family or whether it's a congregation. There, there's material needs, economic needs. All loyalty groups also have needs which are uh, which are I, I described using the word cohesion. They have the the need to be worked on in order to build the internal loyalties because. They, they come apart, they can be put to, back together again, but it's, it, it, it takes work. It's something that, that, that you, you have to work hard in order to do. And all loyalty groups also have a cultural inheritance, which is the, the traditional ideas that are handed down from one generation to the next within the loyalty group, within the congregation or the nation or the family. And th th that traditional inheritance, it also it needs to be worked on, it needs to be built up, it needs to be improved. Sometimes it, 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 it winds down and it needs to be improved or you can see it's going wrong, you need to fix it. So um, you're absolutely right that sustainability is, is a big, but I think that it's correct to say that every loyalty group, every group that is based on mutual loyalties is at a given moment is either declining or it's flourishing. And um, the the, the, the job of the conservative, the person who's thinking about these things, is to say, well, if it's declining, what do we need for it to go back to flourishing? And if it's flourishing, what can we do in order to strengthen the direction of the flourishing so that it doesn't, so, 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 so that we have some time before it starts collapsing again? Um, so I think, I think flourishing is an uh, integral part of what I mean by sustainability. Thank you for uh, pointing that out to me. So um, what, do, what do I think about sustainability? I think that freedom is what is sustainable. The beauty of freedom is that you're free to choose the groups that you create, that you build, that you make. Uh, it's not that long ago in our history, in our traditions. You weren't free to choose your own family. Families were decided by others of who should marry whom, uh, and, and you weren't free in terms of how many children you'd have because there was no control over it. it was, that was a metaphysical fact. Today, we have means by which we get to decide, decide about family and so on. Uh, the Einstein Institute that you mentioned, corporations, businesses, are groups that we create for particular purposes. Uh, 
that are mutually uh, agreed upon voluntarily that serve the individual uh, purposes, the individual goals of the different members of it, where you can leave if you don't like it. The problem is that when you get into political groups, i.e. nations, something else enters the picture that does not enter the picture when we're just interacting with one another in a free society, and that is the potential for use of coercion and force. Then there's the potential of one group imposing its will on another group or one special uh, pressure group imposing its will on somebody else. That is the essence of unsustainability. That is what destroys cohesion and unity and, and, and this idea of sustainability. I think when people are free, free to join whatever groups they want, leave whatever groups they want, commit to whatever relationships they want, not commit to other relationships, that is the most sustainable kind of human society possible. It is the only society that does not pit human being against human being. It is the only society that recognizes that life does not and should not be a zero-sum game. It is a win-win kind of relationship. That's sustainable. Sorry. My name is Jacob Brunton. I'm a Christian egoist. Kind of make both of you mad. Um, <laughs> uh, my question is mainly for Dr. Hazoni, but uh, maybe Dr. Brooke can answer too. Um, are there objective moral principles which transcend tradition? And if so, shouldn't we pursue those objective moral principles individually, with our families, with our churches, communities, whatever, regardless of what tradition says? In other words, what really is the value of tradition if there are objective moral principles that we can identify objectively? Right. Great question. Look, from, a, from, from the perspective of an individualist, uh, the, tr traditions are, are I, I think, largely dispensable. I mean, Joran can correct me, but it, I, I think that the individualist is usually saying, we have a tradition that you take care, you take care of your, your ment me mentally ill a family member. That's our tradition. But actually, a better way of looking at it would be to say everybody's free. They make their own decisions. You can decide or not. And so lots of people won't take care of their mental, mentally ill relative. Uh, I think um, that a conservative view answers the question the following way. Um, yes, there are transcendent um, uh, principles. They uh, are not things that you can easily discover. What we do in history, in history, is that, that different groups seek those principles. Tradition is the instrument that we use in order to seek those principles. Even Yaron and people like Ayn Rand, who, uh, in fact, many Enlightenment figures, who say that they're exercising reason and they don't need tradition, if you actually look at what they're doing, you'll see that that what they're doing is they're, they're inheriting a certain tradition and they're elaborating it. The, the, the tradition is the instrument that a group uses in order to seek the truth. Conservatives think that a lot of that is trial and error, that, that the, 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 uh, the, the balance between the king and the parliament, uh, which, which leads to uh, unprecedented freedom in, in the United Kingdom, is not necessarily something that somebody sat down and did designed, but once people saw how it worked, they understood that it was, that they understood that it was something good. So um, if, like me, you think that there is no way of escaping your tradition, that there are, there, there are different traditions around you of a certain degree to, of uh, ability to choose among them, but mostly, um, Euronis, there he is, channeling Moses, um, then then you you care more about the fact that uh, that uh, the, the uh, what it is the tradition gives you because it's the tradition that allows you to reason in a way that's competent. I thought of myself as Moses, but I, I might take you up. I, I'm I'm just I'm I'm going to keep hammering on this. I I feel like I'm on a roll with it. Um, so, if what you mean by tradition is a history. A certain knowledge of this trial and error that has happened in the past and its consequences, then it is important. It's important we understand what happened in the past, what works and what doesn't work, as long as we have the right standard for what works means. 
But then what is required for us to do is to take all those experiences, to evaluate them and abstract from them, as good scientists would do, the principles that should guide our lives. So yes, we might have a lot of experience of people out there doing all kinds of things in, uh, you know, in marriage, lying, cheating, uh, loving, uh, uh, lots of different things. And we can extract from it what achieves a good, successful marriage, and that would be the principle of a good marriage. So morality is the same thing. Morality is not derived, detached from reality, detached from experience, detached from knowledge, by some uh, rationalistic uh, uh, deduction. It is a consequence of knowing human experiences, of knowing history, of knowing the different trials and errors that sometimes we ourselves might do, and learning from the consequence of those, and learning from all the concrete examples and abstracting away the principles. Lying is actually not good for you. It's really, really bad because you suffer the consequences. Honesty is a virtue. That was very simplistic, but you get the idea. So, object, objective moral principles, uh, to the extent that tradition is in opposition to what you've achieved as an objective moral principle, it should be rejected. To the extent that it happens to be true, it can be bolstered now by a better understanding of the, of the ideas that stand behind it, of the concrete examples and the abstract principles that it supports. We're getting near the end of our program. I think we have two more questioners. I'm going to uh, exercise my set three, two over here at four. So if we can quicken the pace, quick questions, quick answers, and we'll try to get you all in. And please, if you're not standing now, unless you're extremely provoked, stay seated. All right? So let's start from over there. In the conversation around uh, unity and cohesion as a, as a value, what happens to the dissenting group, especially when they... Uh, threaten that as a value, that whether that's an individual dissenter or a minority group? Well, I, I, think, I think in a system of freedom, uh, nothing, they, they, they don't accept it. They, they live their lives. I always tell my, my, my socialist friends, in quotes, that if they, want to be, if they want to be socialist under capitalism, they can go start their commune and live pathetic, miserable lives uh, to each according uh, to his needs, from each according to his ability. And nobody's going to stop them from doing that as long as they do it voluntarily. So you can live the kind of life you want in a free society. The problem is once you start chipping away at freedom, then you start imposing your will on groups that might not agree with the majority called. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Zong, do you have any? Oh, I, 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 don't, I don't actually think that that's what you think, Iran. Um, <laughs> Here, on, on page 133, you, you say cap capitalism is, is the system that institutionalizes freedom in order to protect a specific way of life, a life of reason, pr pr productiveness, and trade. Okay? You are setting up a system to protect those things that you most value. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. But, I, but I'm only talking about protecting also. I'm sorry. Look, this entire thing about, uh, uh, about Chazoni, you must be trying to get people to, to force people to have children. The state is going to force them. Come on, this is, this is ridiculous. Both of us are talking about what it takes in order to make a society flourish and what it takes to make it sustainable. And I'm arguing that the values that Yaron is teaching are not sustainable. And I've told you why they're not sustainable. They're not sustainable because he ignores the fact that families and tribes and nations are, 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 are not constructed through mutual, uh, through, through trade. He's taking the values of businessmen in the marketplace and saying, you can build a family like that too. This has nothing to do with the government, government coercion. The question is, is his philosophical system sustainable? The answer is, no, it's not sustainable. If you start treating your wife the way you treat people in the marketplace, then she'll hit you upside the head. And if you keep doing it, then she'll throw you out. You have to treat her a different way. Right? In, in our tradition, the way that a husband and wife treat one another is called honoring. You give honor. What does give honor mean? It, it, it basically means that you, you find ways to suck up to them. 
to you, you no, I'm serious. I, I I understand this is strange for liberals just don't believe this because liberals think, oh, you know, the, we, we, we just we just we just uh, uh, are happy within each other's company. But that isn't true. If you have a tradition, if you have a tradition for how to hold the marriage together, then you know that the honor that you give your wife, every time you give honor to your wife, you're strengthening the loyalty of the relationship. Nobody teaches you that in 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 in. in, in, in in philosophy of freedom classes, you can only learn that in traditional societies that hand down how to keep a marriage together. That's what we're arguing about, is whether we need those traditions or not. Um, two questions, one for Yoram and one for your own. Uh, Yoram, uh, in principle, how is the centrally planned economy that you advocate for different from socialism or communism. And um, your own, you mentioned a free market in education. So taking the government out of education. Uh, what other sector, uh, well, let me ask you this, what sector would you not leave up to the free market? Okay. Everything that I've ever read that's, that advocates socialism or communism takes it as a given that, uh, that a central planner is able to do better than, than the free market at allocating resources, <coughs> at introducing innovation, at cultivating growth. I don't believe anything like that. I basically think that when I go to, the, to a government bureaucrat who's sitting in some, <coughs> some ministry, I'm dealing with a mediocrity, usually just like Aaron says. <coughs> I'm usually dealing with someone who doesn't have incentives to help me with whatever my problems are and does have incentives to make my life annoying because it's fun for him. All right? that, I, 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 have no, I have no sympathy for that. I have no sympathy for the, the socialist idea whatsoever. But I do think that there's a difference between uh, what, what Yaron proposes, which, which is... Uh, a government that doesn't have any leeway to intervene in order to to, to deal with the most pressing and uh, uh, most pressing problems that the nation is facing, and uh, and 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 one where the government just intervenes in everything. Okay, so Yaron says it's a slippery slope. I understand the slippery slope. I'm actually sympathetic. I think that argument is is empir empirically has a lot going for it. But in principle, when you're talking about Alexander Hamilton, when, what he's talking about, when he's talking about a vigorous executive, he's not talking about, you know, a, a federal government that has, you know, three or four million bureaucrats on his payroll. He's talking about the, the ability of the, of the executive to spot things that are real dangers to command a small number of people sitting, sitting with his team and to issue directives in order to try to deal with it. Look, I'm not an economist, and uh, and uh, your own probably can uh, can help me better than than I can with this. But I think a simple way of looking at this is socialists think that if 70 percent of GDP is being taken up by by government activities on any possible subject, they think that's okay. That makes sense. I think that 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 if you're talking about 10 percent of GDP being directed to things like um, like, 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 in, in, in investing in um, in uh, um, dual use technologies that private firms are doing basic research on in order to be able to beat the Chinese because right now they're they're kicking the daylights out of us. Or um, if the government says, "Look, we have three times as many." Um, uh, STEM PhDs being produced in China as in the United States. With, they, with six times as many engineers, the free market is not causing us to be able to reach a point where we're going to be able to defend this country a few years from now. So the government has to do something about it. I, I, I think there's a big difference between the, the really pressing things and, and everything. Yeah, so the challenge here is what is the principle? Once there is no principle, and I think what Joan is suggesting is 
really is, there's no principle. The principle is when they think whoever's in charge that something is really, really bad, then they will intervene. But there's no principle guiding what really, really bad is. The principle that guides, would guide me in that sense is the government has no business in the business of business. It has no business in economics. Why? And this goes to the question I was asked. Government is coercion. Government is force. Government is a gun. As Washington said, I think, in the second inaugural address. Government is a gun. Government is force. Well, where is force appropriate? Not in the classroom. Not in our hospitals. Not in our boardrooms. But force is necessary in one place. In the place where force is being used against us, force and self-defense is necessary. So government's job, and the only thing government should do, is be an actor on our behalf, our agent, of self-defense. And in that sense, government should only have a police, a military, and a judiciary. And that's it. It doesn't need, we don't need to bring a gun into a thing. God, I'm in Texas. I forgot. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we don't need to bring a gun into all of our human activities. We don't need to bring the power of coercion into all of our human activities. The only activity where a gun is necessary, where coercion is justified, is in self-defense. And that's the job of government, period. And that's the principle. And it limits. Thank you. Last question on this side, then we have one more question. All right, I'm um, a student here at Salem Center. One question for each, Dr. Ozzoni. Um, I, earlier you did say that individualism was a little incomplete for the reasons that you did state, but uh, I'm a little curious. How, can conservatism be considered complete if the values that um, you said were to be, the values that are there that show how to live a proper life are kind of scattered all over the place, hard to find, and is up to us, we who are capable of error, to make the right judgments as to how to apply these values when times are always changing? As for Dr. Brooke, um, uh, it seems like that's what's core to individualism is the pursuit of happiness and um, whatever makes you happy is enough. But is, is that all there is to it? Is, is that all there is to life? And if, if living a principled life isn't part of what makes you happy, then is it okay to live an unprincipled life in the pursuit of happiness? And where's the meaning in that? I guess I should ask. Dr. Zahn, do you have to go? I forgot the question. Could you say the question again? You go first. We'll, we'll clear it out. He's running back. Oh, he's running back. No, I, I, got, I get so interested in the second question that I got. <laughs> Sorry, I should have been more concise. Um, it, can conservatism be considered complete if um, the values that are supposed to guide us to the best life are so scattered and capable of being judged incorrectly by us now okay. when times are changing from where they were in the past. Got it. Maybe let me go before I forget it again. Please. <laughs> I, look, I, I don't mean that conservatism is complete. Okay? My, my own view is uh, political theoretical systems, you know, the, we develop them by trial and error. Uh, we, we learn as we go along. Um, I, I, I think it's striking that the that conservatives who have spoken on the subject of what are the principles that need to be the statesman, conservatives come up with a much longer list than, than your own individualism does. Right? To, to go back to the, to the, to the conservative uh, preamble of the American Constitution, there are seven principles there, and the Obviously, there are trade-offs between them. And the moment you have seven principles, you say, well, you know, who, want, who is to decide? And the answer, the only answer is you try to elect the best people, and it's their job to make the decisions. You can, you can argue with them, but, that, but that's, that's the answer. Conservatives say, look, nothing else is realistic. If you try to tell me, well, actually, there's only one principle that matters, and that's individual freedom. So I, I've said all evening, that if you try to say there's only one principle and that's individual freedom, then what you get is something that is, uh, that, that is radically incomplete. Okay, maybe, you know, maybe the seven principles of, of, uh, of the founders were incomplete, but the one principle is much more incomplete, or, or two. So you get something that's incomplete. It's so incomplete that you can't even understand what's going on in your society. You, you, you look at it and you, you, you see, 
we're losing to China. We're, we're, we're losing the ability to, 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 for political parties to, to give transitions of power from one, one to another. We're losing the ability to have children. We're losing the ability to keep together marriage. And the government just sits back and says, well, who, you know, who would decide on these things? You know, it's not our job. So a conservative says, what are you talking about? You've been elected to be responsible. You're you know, if, you, if you're the father or the mother of a family, you, things come up that you've never in your life dreamed that you'd ever have anything to do with. You can't say, you know, oh, well, I'm not trained for this. No matter what comes up, you have to do, be responsible. It's the same thing with the head of state. They have to be responsible no matter what comes up. Seven principles is a pretty good attempt at describing it. It doesn't mean it's complete. It doesn't mean it's final. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say... Um, I think all those problems that we face with China and everybody else are a consequence of the fact that someone is trying to do way too much and doing things that it shouldn't do. But let me get to the happiness. Um, yes, pursuing happiness is it. Happiness is the goal. It's the focus. How do you pursue happiness is a challenging question. And it requires principle. It requires thought out principle by which to live. You can't go, how does this make me feel? How does that make me feel? Let me figure it out now. You need some principles to guide you, some ideas about what is right and what is wrong, what will lead to a better life, a happier life, a more fulfilling life, what will destroy that life. Avoid the parts that destroy, go for the parts that do. But don't contrast principle life versus happiness. No. If you have the right principle, they will lead you to a happy life. And indeed, if you don't, you will never get happiness. Happiness is not, as Jordan Peterson said, you quoted him, <laughs> is not, as Jordan Peterson said, just something that happens to you out of the blue. You suddenly, boom, happiness drops in upon you. <laughs> happiness is a consequence of the choices and actions that you pursue in life. Now, there's luck. Of course, there's luck that plays a role here, but that is not the essential. And the choices and actions that you must take are ones that are guided by principle to arrive through your use of reason, reason based on experience, reason based on studying the world, studying human beings, studying, in a sense, what is worth and what doesn't work, what is good for you and what is not good for you. Last question, please. Is this still on? I guess it is. Um, I have a question actually for both of you, and I'm not sure which should be first to answer, but <clears throat> a decade ago, I was in Bulgaria for a year, and one of the primary things I did was to teach a number of classes of kids from five to 14 or 15 from a wealthy families that put them in a private school. And my job was to teach them American English by virtue of anything I wanted to talk about, as long as I was talking American English. Um, so the topics I talked about were uh, several fold, but one of the biggest ones was I would talk a little bit about really basic ideas of philosophy not trying to teach them an entire course, but just basic ideas. And one of the basic ideas that I've talked about often was happiness and doing something to build happiness. Um, I'm skipping over a thousand details there, but that's the point. So four months into it, there was a student that was one of the most challenging in the group room. His name was Donnie. And he suddenly looked very disturbed. And he stood up and said, Mr. Withrow, you don't mean that this thing that you're saying to take steps to build happiness, you don't mean that's like a higher standard than the family, do you? Because of course the family is the highest. And I stopped and he stopped and everybody just sort of stood there looking at each other. And I realized I was facing a conflict I hadn't expected to face. I didn't expect anyone to ever have that position. My apologies to uh, various people in the world, but I didn't think of that as being something that could possibly be taken higher than the choice of what to do to build happiness based on your mind and your rationality. So I just stopped, he stopped, and I said, let's talk about that after class. And mm -hmm. so we did. We spent an hour afterwards talking about it. My question, though, is was that silly of me to not realize that that was going to be coming up as a, as a major conflict uh, I hadn't heard of it before, but I sure as heck heard of it then. And it turned out that I met several other students. This was in Bulgaria, you know, so this was European. Uh, they often had that viewpoint, and <clears throat> some of them would name tradition as a background for why that made sense, by the way. So I was surprised, and my question for you is, 
Um, was I silly or uh, naive to not realize that was going to be a major problem for us? It really hit me. Uh, so I, what I said to him, though, afterwards was, well, I'm not just saying happiness is important, but that your purpose, your way of getting it is to build your own happiness, which means you take the job. You're responsible for that, just like you're responsible for everything else in your life. Well, I think we have your question. So Thank you so much. We have your question. Yeah, there's my question. Thank you. Thanks. Look, I, I, ju I just think that, uh, that uh, if, if you think, and I understand probably, you know, most people in the room probably do think this, but it, if you think that you can build from the ground up a view of happiness, right, that you, you, you've invented it yourself, you know, either from whole cloth, you know, doing things that nobody's ever done before, or by, uh, by, by uh, researching every option that exists on the face of the earth and, and, and uh, uh, making decisions, if you think that you can get to happiness that way, I, look, we're at an impasse because I think you're mistaken. I think that, that those kids who have grown up in free to be whatever you want to be, you make the choices. It's all up to you. When they grow up in that, they... Many, many, many of them, maybe not every last one, but most of them, they reach a complete intolerable impasse. They reach an inability to decide, should I get married? Should I not get married? Should I serve in the military? Should I not serve in the military? Should I start a business? Should I not start a business? Anybody who's dealt with these kids, the ones who have grown up on nothing but that, right? When, when, when you deal with them, you find that they are completely paralyzed by the freedom that they've been given. And this, is, this isn't like some kind of surprise. This is Durkheim. This is Nietzsche. People have been saying this already for, for, for 130 years. If you take away all the guide rails that tell people plus minus, here's a good life, you take away all the guide rails and you say, you invent it yourself, then they don't invent it themselves. Usually what they end up doing is just stuck and they go nowhere. Sometimes instead of being stuck and going nowhere, they, they, they go, you know, they go join the Nazi party or, 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 or communists. Or they, they do lunatic things because they don't know how to make these choices. And so, yes, I'm in favor of reason. I don't want to say anything about reason, but I don't think we, we, I don't think we properly understand reason. The tradition that Burke and, and, and his predecessors, the common lawyers, they, they understood that reason is something that begins from an inherited tradition. And then different people, they, 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 they play with it. They move to one side or another in order to exercise their creativity. But nothing, giving nothing, just saying reason, that you're, you're killing them. You're just, you're just killing them. Dr. Burke? Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody argues that every individual should invent everything whole cloth. That is just not the case. Uh, individuals need moral guidance. They benefit from moral guidance. The real question is, where does that moral guidance come from? And what I am arguing is that that moral guidance comes from uh, reason. Not that they invented whole, whole cloth, but that they, that they consult philosophers who help them find the principles to guide them towards happiness. There is an important role for philosophers in the world as moral teachers, as moral guides. But those philosophers do not impose or do not suggest their moral ideas or shouldn't just because I said so. Those moral ideas need to be presented in a way that shows, proves, suggests to uh, our young people why they should follow that moral guide. What are the reasons for it? In the end, the individual does need to rely on their own reason to choose their values based on this guidance. It's not like everybody needs to be their own philosopher. But the sad situation that we live in today that I think you're describing is not that we tell people they're free. What we tell people is that there are no standards. We tell people that they should follow their emotions. That they should do whatever they feel like doing. That happiness comes from doing what you feel like doing, from embracing the moment, from that there are no principles, that there is no guide, that there are no truths, that reason is not efficacious. Indeed, they shouldn't trust their mind. They should just go by emotion. 
And we've got an entire generation that is influenced by this emotionalism. And yes, emotions are not tools of cognition. Emotions are not guides towards happiness. Happiness is something that needs the guidance of reason and that needs the guidance of uh, principles. Great. Thank you very much. We'll now end with some uh, five-minute closing statements by both of our speakers. Dr. Brooke, do you care to start us off? God. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Take a breath. Take your time. So we live in a world today um, that is clearly, or I think everybody has a sense, and we can show that it's in decline. Real choices about the future of, of, uh, of this country, of the world in which we live, need to be made. The system we have today, to use words we've talked about before, is not sustainable. The path we are on is not sustainable. We are offered today two alternatives politically. We are offered a collectivism of the left that wants to take our freedoms, whatever are left of them, and to a large extent, destroy them. We offer the alternative to what we have today is more of the same, more government intervention, more thought control, more control over what we do and how we do. The individual is lost. And on the right, we are offered a return to some mythological past in which